In order to get a job as a developer, many people have to complete a take-home coding challenge. In fact, lots of people get given the Gilded Rose Carter or another refactoring exercise from my collection. Because I'm a bit of a code carter enthusiast. And if you look at my GitHub, I've got about 150 of them. I've spent many hours working on solving these. And it's not actually because I need to pass a job interview. It's because I think it's a great way to learn useful skills for real legacy code. In this video, I'm going to share four steps for getting unfamiliar code under control. Hi, I'm Emily Bache. I'm a software developer and creator of Saman Coaching. Welcome to my channel. This video is sponsored by Tupel, who make an app for remote pair and ensemble programming for both Mac OS and Windows. And I'd like to show you just how smooth it is. So I'm going to call up my friend Jack to help me with this bit of code. Hi, Jack. So I can just share my screen with one click and then he can look at the code and help me out. Yeah, I spotted something he wants to change there. And Jack can just dive right in and start editing in my machine on my code. And we can collaborate really well. So uh, do check it out. Go to their website. There's a link in the show notes. Now, a job interview is a stressful situation for tackling difficult code. But then legacy code is often stressful once you've got the job too. And I think a lot of employers use these exercises to get a feel for how you cope when faced with an awkward design and how well you get on with a job of improving it. Not every developer is comfortable in this situation, but it is actually a very learnable skill. Let me break it down for you. Solving a refactoring challenge or dealing with legacy code often goes better if you follow these four steps. I'm going to go through them and look at some examples. First, you need to rapidly get a handle on the most important issues facing you in the code you've been given. So the first skill here is something that I call scanning. It's where you look through the code at a superficial level, letting your visual pattern matching identify the interesting properties of the code as if it was text. I mean, you're not so much reading the code as seeing it like a picture. Before you do this, it does help if you run the code through a standard formatter, normalize the indentation, lay things out in a standard way, and ensure you've got your syntax highlighting switched on. So do that first, but then just scroll slowly through the code. And just from that, you should be able to spot code smells like long method and deep nesting and code paragraphs. It actually goes very quickly and you can get an overview of a large amount of code in seconds. So in this example code I'm showing here, I think you should be able to spot a long method as I'm scrolling slowly through it. There's also some deep nesting, and you can see that from the shape of the indentation. I've got a series of videos for training exactly this kind of skill. Take a look at my playlist called Sparrow Decks. I'll explain more what that is in the videos. But in an interview situation, if you can talk intelligently about some design problems that you spot really quickly, that's bound to be impressive. Then again, if you scan the code and you don't spot any of those issues, that can be really useful information too. If there aren't any long methods, then the complexity might be in too many small elements that aren't organized very well. So this is where it could help to open the code in a good editor or an IDE and look at the structure view. And that view will analyze the class and method structures and show you what classes there are, what method signatures they have. And for example, here, this class has got a bunch of small private methods in the same class. And some of those probably should be moved elsewhere. If you haven't got a structure view, just folding up the code can achieve a similar effect. Collapse all will hide everything except the top level class and method declarations. So your goal at this point is to identify the top level classes and whether there's a problem with the way that the methods are distributed between them, or whether actually, as I said before, you've got a long method with too much complexity in, in that one method. All of these techniques are about showing your ability to quickly find and analyze obvious design problems. Hopefully your interview will be impressed or you'll be able to get quickly going with the next step. Beyond reading the code, the next step is to look for quick wins, where you can safely make design improvements without much effort. One thing it's easy to check is whether your IDE will flag up obvious problems in the code for you. For example, here IntelliJ has highlighted this line, it's a very stupid bit of logic, and it can fix it for you straight away, very quick win. One thing to look for is if you can find any code paragraphs. 
that you can easily extract and name. Particularly if the code paragraph starts with a short comment, it'll tell you what to name the new method. And naming is really important and one of the hardest things to do well. If you've got a long method, then it might be worth looking for variables with a long scope. Highlight them with the cursor so that the editor will put a mark in the right-hand scroll bar in all the places where they're used, so you can see them even if they're off the screen. So if you've got a variable with a long scope, it could be more important to understand that one than the other variables that are there. And if they're used repeatedly, you could try some refactorings like split variable or replace derived variable with query and a quick win to improve the code. As you're starting to read the code in more detail and you're getting a better understanding of what it does, make sure to document your understanding in the code. Anytime you gain an insight about what a variable or method is really doing, take the chance to rename it, improve the names in the code, even if they start to get a bit long. In this example, I might rename this variable s to score or player name. I think that's better than adding comments in the code because these names will actually show up in your code navigation tools and your stack traces, and they'll stick around for longer, basically. If you have some rather complex conditionals, then there's a lot you can do to safely transform them. Look for conditions in the negative form, if not something, and then just flip them. Your editor can do that for you basically for free. It turns the conditional into the positive form, which is usually easier to understand. There are a bunch of other safe conditional manipulations like De Morgan's law will let you turn an and into an or. Through just fiddling around with conditional logic, often you can get a better understanding of what the conditional logic is actually for and why it's there. At this stage where you're looking for these quick wins, it's important to only commit safe transformations on the code. You're learning about the structure and trying to improve it. Quite a lot of the time though, you'll probably fail and need to just back out your changes. So this is a good, time to just be exploring and seeing what you can find out about the code. It doesn't actually matter if you have to throw away the refactorings that you're trying out. Are you enjoying the video so far? Don't forget, subscribe to my channel and like the video. The techniques I'm talking about today are explained in more detail in other videos on this channel. I've also recently released a training course called Coding Interview Challenge Practice. You can find it on O'Reilly's online learning platform. And if you haven't got an account with them already, you can sign up for a free trial to access my course. There's also a link in the show notes. You reach step three, when you've read the code in enough detail that you begin to see the big picture and have identified the most difficult issues with the design. So at this point, instead of just going ahead and doing some refactoring, take a moment to communicate. What are the big problems that you can see? And what kind of design changes would improve the situation? It's always important in a development team to be able to communicate your design ideas and discuss them with colleagues. So in a job interview, explaining what you're thinking can really show how you'd be an asset to your development team. Code carters aren't very large, but they can still help you to illustrate your design skills. For example, in theatrical players, you can quickly realize that the challenge is you've got this long method that mixes presentation logic with business rules. And it's good to communicate the overall goal of splitting those into different classes. In Parrot, you've got repeated switches on a type code, indicating that the design could benefit from making those type codes into actual objects. Explain your plan. You're going to move functionality out of the Parrot class and into subtypes or other collaborators. A design with several smaller, simpler classes should be more flexible. So this is where doing code carters in a group or using the guided learning hours from this channel could be really useful preparation. Because when you're pair programming, you naturally practice explaining your ideas and communicating clearly about code and design. The fourth stage is actually completing that large refactoring that you've decided on. Big refactorings need to be broken down into smaller steps with intermediate designs that still work but might temporarily be more ugly than what you started with. For example, in Parrot, you might reach a stage where you've pushed down a method from the superclass and duplicated it in all the subclasses. So the code works, but there's more code than before, and it's arguably harder to understand than it was before. It's a step on the road though, and it's better to do that 
copying lots of code, then risk breaking it by just trying to copy the pieces you need and pasting the parts to the right places, and you're more likely to get it wrong if you do it that way. Code carters can help you to practice the moves you need to be able to complete these kinds of design transformations smoothly and safely. On my channel, I already have several videos of how to solve the parrot carter, and I'm sure I'll have more videos like that in future. The more you practice, the smoother you get. In a job interview, it's good to be able to show you know how to use your refactoring tools. If you're preparing for an upcoming coding interview with hands-on refactoring exercises, then I hope I've given you some useful tips. Knowing the four steps outlined in this video should give you a head start. Read the code, scanning, folding, structure view. Look for quick wins, safe, tactical, tool-based refactorings. Communicate your plan in words, and then refactor safely in small steps towards your goal. As with all coding skills, you need hands-on practice to really get fluent with refactoring. And code carters are great for practice. And the skills that you're learning are not only for job interviews, especially if your job will mean working with legacy code. There's also something deeply satisfying about practicing on code carters and noticing how much better you get the more you repeat them. As humans, one of our intrinsic motivations is mastery, getting good at things. Some of that comes from repetition. Doing a code carter again and again, getting smoother and faster, can be really satisfying. As you're learning, it helps to practice together with others, explain your ideas, celebrate successes together. I recommend attending a code retreat or a coding dojo or doing learning hours from this channel. If you can, get some mentoring from a skilled technical coach. Job interviews are a lot about confidence, being able to talk about your understanding of the situation and show that you know what you're doing. It all goes better with practice. Happy coding and good luck. <laughs>